Well, greeting in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear these words from Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name, make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to the Lord, sing praises to God, tell of all God's wonderful works. Indeed, we gather to glorify God and to worship God. Welcome to Indian Trail Presbyterian Church's virtual worship service this week. And thank you for joining us whenever you join us and however you join us. I want to start with a word for our young people this morning. Last week, if you were worshiping with us, you know that I, I shared a story from Mark Gelman's book, Does God Have a Big Toe? Stories about stories in the Bible. And we read a story about Moses and about how Moses might have found out or begun to understand that he was Jewish after he had grown up in the uh, Egyptian palace. And today we're going to read a second story about Moses, and this is a after Moses has grown up and uh, he has killed an Egyptian uh, taskmaster for abusing a Hebrew slave and has had to flee for his own safety. He's come to the land of Midian, he's gotten married, and he's working for his father-in-law as a shepherd. And, um, and, and in the Bible, God speaks to Moses out of a burning bush to call Moses to be um, the one who will go to Egypt and free the people from slavery. Um, this story, which is called uh, Watching the Burning Bush Burn, is Rabbi Gelman's story about the story of the burning bush. When God set out to pick a leader for the children of Israel, the most important quality God was looking for was patience. God wanted somebody who would not give up no matter how bad things got. No matter how much the people complained, no matter how long it took to get to the land of Israel, God wanted somebody who would be patient. God wanted a patient person to be the leader of the people. So God set out to make a patience test that could be used to find the right person for the job. Now, the angels were always bothering God with ideas, and most of the ideas were not very good, but God was patient. And so God listened to all the ideas that the angels had for a patience test. Gabriel came forward with a tangled ball of string. He said, whoever has the patience to untangle this ball of string surely is our person. God did not like this test because untying knots is just boring. And the kind of people who like to untie knots are also the kind of people who save rubber bands, and that's not exactly what God was looking for in a leader. So then Michael, the angel, flew forward with a little puzzle box. You had to twist it so that all the red squares were on one side and all the green squares on another side and all the yellow squares on another side and all the blue squares on another. Michael said, this is a great patience test. You have to figure out how to get all the same colors on all the same size. I'm still working on this one, so any person who can solve this puzzle surely is our person. God sent Michael away after explaining to Michael that you do not need patience to solve puzzles as much as you need persistence. And God was convinced that some of the very worst leaders the world has known were very persistent people. Then, of course, God had an idea that was the very best patience test of all. God caused a bush to start burning. He caused this to happen in the desert just near where some shepherds were pasturing their flocks. A few of the shepherds passed by the bush and kept walking. They didn't even notice that the bush was burning, but not burning up. Bushes are not all that special, you see, and, and bushes on fire are really not all that much more special. So nobody took the time to sit long enough to recognize the miracle. Moses, who had run away from the palace and become a shepherd, saw the bush and sat down on the ground. And Moses watched and watched 
until he recognized the miracle. Moses saw that the bushes' leaves were burning and the bushes' branches were black, just like an ordinary burning bush. But the thing that was different is that this burning bush did not burn up. It just continued to burn and burn and burn. The branches never fell down in a heap and the fire never went out. And Moses was the only one who waited long enough to notice. Moses tried to get the other shepherds to come over and watch the bush with him, but they all had better things to do. Well, Moses had some better things to do as well. He just didn't know about them yet. The end. Let's pray together. God, help us to be still. Help us to know the wisdom of stopping and sitting down and watching and waiting that we might recognize your miracles around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this week comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Now, last week, uh, if you joined us, you might remember that we, uh, we read from chapter 1 of Exodus where Pharaoh, who has become scared of the proliferation of the Hebrew people, uh, they're multiplying and becoming so numerous and flourishing in the land, Pharaoh has become scared of what they might mean for the future of Egypt, and he has decided on the unthinkable plan of committing infanticide. He has decided to kill the, the newborn baby boys of the Hebrew people. And when that plan is uh, kind of doesn't work because the Hebrew midwives don't participate, he then incorporates all the Egyptians together to participate in that plan. That last verse of chapter one is quite ominous. Pharaoh commands all his people that every boy that is born of the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile but every girl you shall let live. Well, because of that, in chapter 2, we have read that Moses' mother, when she gives birth to her baby boy, hides him in a basket in the river, only to be found by Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, who takes Moses into the palace and raises him in the Egyptian palace. Moses grows up. He, he sees the plight of his people who are oppressed and enslaved and in anger, he actually kills an Egyptian taskmaster who is abusing a Hebrew slave. He then has to flee for his own safety because he's scared for his life uh, when Pharaoh finds out what he has done. Well, Moses has now uh, uh, found himself in Midian, a land far away from Egypt, and he is, he's gotten married, and he's now working for his father-in-law as a shepherd, and that's where our story picks up at the beginning of chapter 3. Let us listen for a word from God. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord God saw that he had turned aside, God called out to Moses from the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And then God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their ta taskmasters, and indeed I know their sufferings. 
So I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. This cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So God said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What am I going to say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. We take a deep breath of your spirit, holy God. And pray that you would speak to us in these words of scripture. And in their proclamation, by the power of your spirit, amen. Well, I had a sermon last week. In fact, this was going to be a little bit easier week for me because uh, in preparation for my sermon last week, I had actually kind of prepared two sermons and I was ready to preach the second part of the sermon this week and then... And then a police officer shot Jacob Blake in the back several times in Wisconsin. And in the aftermath of that, building on events in past months, the voices have arisen from all sides. Voices have arisen telling us what to believe about what happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin, on last Sunday, August the 23rd. Voices have arisen in the streets of cities across the country, crying out for an end to the repeated killing of unarmed black Americans. Voices have arisen from others claiming the absolute necessity of supporting our law enforcement officers. Voices arise in praise of the protesters who are crying out for justice, and voices arise in condemnation of rioters who are looting and setting fires. Voices everywhere arise around us. To whom do we listen? Which of those voices should have our attention as God's people? It's an interesting question to have in mind as we read the narrative of Moses and God and Pharaoh and the, the Egyptian and Hebrew people in these first chapters of Exodus. It's an interesting question. To whom should we listen? Which voices should have our attention? To whom does God listen in this story? Which voices in this story have God's attention? Because we hear from a number of of voices in this narrative. We certainly hear from Pharaoh. We hear from Pharaoh loud and clear when Pharaoh says, I'm scared of this people. They are becoming more numerous than we are. I'm scared of them. And so we're going to kill the baby boys of the Hebrews. And then Moses basically deputizes all the people of Egypt and says, all you, my people of Egypt, you good people of Egypt, you shall be my deputies and, and you shall throw the baby boys of the Hebrews in the Nile when they are born. We will rid ourselves. We will control 
these filthy Hebrew people. Voices, the voice of Pharaoh is loud and clear in his hatred and violence. But you know, God doesn't listen to Pharaoh's voice. I mean, certainly God hears what Pharaoh says, but as powerful as Pharaoh is and as powerful as Pharaoh thinks he is, God does not honor Pharaoh with an audience. We also hear from Moses in this story. Mostly we hear from Moses after God has told him what God wants him to do. And mostly we hear from Moses excuses. Uh, what do you mean, God? You, who am I that you're going to send me to Egypt? And God says, don't worry, I will be with you. But, but, but I don't even know your name. Who am I going to tell them this sin to me to them? And God says, well, here's my name. I am who I am and I will be who I will be. But, but, but they might not believe me, Lord. And God says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some signs. I'm taking care of everything. Don't worry about it. But you know, God, I, I'm not much of a public speaker. I'm not good at praying out loud. Lord, I don't have the words. And God said, I will be your words. I will be your mouthpiece. And then finally, the ultimate excuse, the one Moses is really uh, holding down deep in his heart. Lord, just please send somebody else. I don't want to go. But God's not going to send somebody else. God's going to send Moses. So God hears Moses' words, but God's not really paying attention to Moses' excuses. God dismisses them. It's not Moses' voice of excuses that has God's attention most fully. So who does God listen to in this story, in this narrative of an enslaved people, oppressed by Pharaoh? It's the people. It's the people who have God's attention. In the, in the verses that come just before chapter 3 that we just read, in verses 23 and following of chapter 2, we hear this. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and they cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God and God heard their groaning. And God paid attention. God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. It was the voices of the people that God listened to. The voices of the people were the voices that had God's attention in this story. As I said, starting the sermon out, there are lots of voices arising all around us. And I would love to stand up here and tell you these are the voices that you ought to listen to and these are the voices that should have your attention because these are the voices that God wants you to hear and you should listen to me because I'm your preacher and I know what's best for you. I wish I had that wisdom and courage of the Apostle Paul, but I do not. Here's what I can tell you. I can tell you about all the voices I hear crying out all around us. The voices of American people of color who feel endangered by a system of injustice. I hear the voices of citizens who are angry that America is not what they thought it used to be or what they remember it to be, and they are fearful of what America might be becoming. I hear the voices of gay and lesbian and transgender folk who just want to be accepted as human beings. I hear the voices of blue collar Americans of all colors and cultures who feel left behind forgotten by a globalized and technological economy. I hear the voices of women who are weary, weary with the power plays and the 
sexual advances and the bodily assaults of male colleagues and neighbors. I hear the voices of refugees and immigrants caged on our border. So many voices, to whom do we listen? To whom do we pay attention? To whom is God listening? To whom does God pay attention? Maybe we have a lesson to learn from Moses, not that lesson of all the excuses Moses made. I mean, the church has learned that lesson well. We've got lots of excuses. Oh, God, we, you don't send us. I mean, somebody ought to do something about that problem over there, and somebody ought to do something about this, but, but somebody else maybe. Uh, that's not my calling. Uh, we've got other things to do. We've got a budget to work on. We've got other you know, program to plan here in the church. Not, we don't need to learn the lesson of excuses from Moses. The lesson we perhaps need from Moses is the lesson we might learn from, from Moses before he started making all those excuses. When Moses had his eyes opened and saw that burning bush, and he stopped. And he turned aside and he took off his sandals because he acknowledged that he was on holy ground and he listened. for a word from God. Yes, there was going to be stuff to do. Yes, there would be a Pharaoh to confront. Yes, there would be people to lead and liberate. Lots to do. But first, Moses listened. He listened to the voice of God to the God who was listening not to Pharaoh and not to the excuses Moses would make, but the God who listened to the people, crying out from the depths of their despair and oppression. There is so much to do. So much to do in our world. So many voices crying out to us for our attention and our allegiance. It's not hard to hear them. And so may we, the church, the body of Christ, the ones called to exhibit the kingdom of God to the world around us, may we, the church, stop as Moses did. May we turn aside, may we take off our shoes because we know we are on holy ground, and may we listen. May we listen for God's word, for God's revelation. And while we're listening, may that same God meet every one of our excuses with divine wisdom and power. And may we soon, very soon, set out for Egypt. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our prayers of the people this week come from uh, Jill Duffield, editor of the Presbyterian Outlook. Let us turn now to God in prayer. Almighty God, it feels like we are lingering in the wilderness with all these threats around us. We wonder when better days will come, when the public health crisis will abate, when the violence in your world and in our streets will come to an end. When will your people's suffering cease? Almighty God, ease our anxious minds. 
encourage our trembling hearts, embolden our sometimes struggling faith. And as we make our way to your holy mountain to worship, do not let us miss your angels along the way. Attune us to those sights and sounds, those wonders and miracles that you make manifest through ordinary bushes and everyday bread. Hearing your voice call our name astounds us and frightens us. How is it that the maker of heaven and earth knows us by name and entrusts us with doing divine work? As we haltingly say, here I am, and seek faithfully to fulfill your call, remind us again that you are with us always, always and forever surrounding us with your peace and power. Recognizing that you, Lord of all, have observed many injustices and too much sorrow in your beloved world, we ask you to reveal to us how we are to intervene and we begin with praying for those people, places, and circumstances that keep us up at night. As the political process and the election season heats up, and we are tempted to further divide ourselves and demonize each other, we pray for patience, for gentleness, for mutual affection. May our unity in Christ be leavened for the whole world, a witness to what it means to love genuinely, to outdo one another in showing honor. As this pandemic persists, we feel the pain of those most impacted by it, the sick and those who grieve the death of loved ones, the essential workers and those unemployed. We are indeed one body, one singular creation. When one part hurts, we all weep in solidarity. Do not let us neglect to do good, to uphold the weak and strengthen the faint-hearted. May we be so knit together that no one falls through the cracks. As we grow weary with the upheaval of these days, lagging in zeal for the work you set before us, afraid to stand up to the powers and principalities of this world that oppress, exploit, and threaten your good creation, send the flame of your Holy Spirit. Set us ablaze with your power. Help us to burn so brightly that we are indeed the light of the world you call us to be. Make us such close followers of our Lord that we cannot help but live in harmony with each other and bless even those who persecute us. May we freely lose our lives and be saved through the one who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we leave this place, hear now, hear now this charge from the prophet Micah. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of us, the church? to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. The God who now takes us from this place, blessing us and keeping us, being kind and gracious to us, looking upon us with favor and giving us peace. Amen.